Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 40 of the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise here on our podcast, episode 40. Dave, great to see you. Hey, John. Uh, I just saw you yesterday. Thanks for the ride to the airport. (laughs) You were in California for the week. We had our big um, cyber resilience, cyber recovery event sponsored by Dell Technologies. Um, thanks to those guys, but we had a great event. Basically, a lot of scale of con- scalable content went out. It was great, great event, um, great turnout, great traffic. Overall, great response from the community. Um, that event was phenomenal. Great to see the team and uh, your LinkedIn post with the team dinner. <laughs> Everyone's kind of waving. Uh, not not a not a stage photo. Got a lot of likes, Dave. A lot of people uh, in the community are, uh, love that content. So uh, great. God, post we had the- fun in uh, Mountain View. Michael's restaurant was amazing. Great, great event. I wish I was there. I, I missed it. Anyway, so here's what we're going to talk about on the pod today. Obviously, we had our big event last week. We'll go through that real quick. Intel um, had a big event in New York City. They simulcast that around the world. Intel AI everywhere. Not so much, but that's, I call it the not so big splash in the pool. Uh, Pat Gelsinger really made a big deal out of this. And uh, we have analysis on that. I got some inside information from folks in Silicon Valley on that too. So, um, yeah, it's interesting what you see in the press and what the analysts are saying and what really is happening uh, when you hear what's going on in the back channel. We'll we'll, we'll share some of that. Big funding uh, news uh, out there. Mistral AI got a ton of funding. French company. Uh, interesting there in Europe because there's a huge uh, AI regulations uh, in the EU and more guardrails are coming out. It's just seeing AI news, AI hype, and 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 substance coming out of AI, but the the whole regulatory conversation is in in top gear, Dave. It's really kind of a, a kind of a rant, but also a reality right now. We're seeing in the marketplace. Hey, uh, OpenAI put out a research paper. We're going to talk about that. Some good commentary there, Dave. You you made some great observations. Uh, Oracle had uh, earnings, um, and there's more layoffs in media in other areas, Dave. So I mean, it's you're seeing kind of where the results are coming in. Companies are failing. A lot of areas where AI is going to have impact, like media. I mean, I saw Wired laid off some people, Fox, and a bunch of other companies. And then uh, we're going to talk about LinkedIn. I have a comment on LinkedIn uh, as they, owned by Microsoft, as everyone knows, um, are are not moving to Azure. And that came out on CNBC. Jordan Novet wrote an article on that, scooping the fact that LinkedIn's own, Microsoft's own LinkedIn is not moving to their own cloud. Of course, Amazonians are like pimping it up like crazy. Oh, look at that. See, they're not even moving their own people over there. And then finally, I saw Michael Dell on Twitter today talking about oh, Dell. By the way, by the way, sorry to interrupt. I think I think Amazon still runs Oracle. <laughs> it's funny. I'm pretty sure. They don't <laughs> talk about it anymore. Anyway. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that section. And then finally, yeah. Dell Power Edge, according to Michael Dell on Twitter this morning, Dell Power Edge cuts a big deal with Core Weaver and NVIDIA. And why that's important is because we've been saying in the queue, and I put a video out there from our AI that actually proves that we were talking about this and actually happened, that the opportunity for Dell and people in hardware is huge with AI. And I think the Dell Power Edge server deal with NVIDIA and CoreWeave point to the second super cloud model merging. So, you know, um, little nuance point, but it's an indicator. You're starting to see the markers, Dave, of what we've been saying for the past year and going back six years around data and cloud and super cloud all lining up. The markers are there. Intel's AI announcement, the substance wasn't as strong, but the the direction was awesome, right? So you're seeing everything going on. LinkedIn, not going to Azure. Is that because Azure is terrible or is the fact that they're trying to serve all their compute for open AI? We don't know. We'll get to the bottom of it, but let's kick it off. Yeah, so, you know, our Super Studio event, seventh super, Super Studio event out of Palo Alto, Um, I loved the topic. It was all about cyber resiliency. It wasn't a big product, you know, pimpage. Actually, there was very little. There really wasn't any product talk. It was really all thought leadership. Um, And we had the community in, obviously Dell, because they were the sponsor, was very active. But we had CrowdStrike. We had Palo Alto Networks. We had Zias Caravalla. We had Christoph uh, Bertrand from ESG, uh, shared some data. We had uh, partners like Continuity uh, 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 from Gil Hecht came in from Israel. We had CISOs. It was, you know, it's a really important topic, John. And, you know, one of my big takeaways is people used to think DR was how they created business resiliency. And they're realizing now that, wow, with cyber attacks and ransomware on the rise the way they are, 
you know, DR strategies don't cut it. You have to actually build in a, a you know combination of stop the breach and be able to recover from the breach. Uh, and it's a whole new line of thinking that is really being put forth by the community. I thought it was a really good uh, more than a half day session. It well, was, I think one of the amazing. things that you interviewed John Scimone, Scimone, I think that's how you pronounce John Scimone. Shim, Shimone. Shimone. I had it wrong too. Shimone. Sh Shimone. I liked his interview because he talked about the, the Sony hack, which goes back, Dave, years. Now, if you look at that time in history, and again, we commented the cues around 13 years, as everyone knows, um, we talked about that. But that's, if you look at, go back to that Sony hack to now, it's unbelievable. It's still happening. The whole ransomware market. And so the whole cyber threat. That threats. was 2014. Oh, right? my God. Yeah, it's and like, you go back to Stuxnet even before that, right? It's unbelievable the threats are coming. So, I, you know, I really think this conversation of data protection recovery is not so much about data protection, but the recovery piece of it, because you assume you're going to be hit. The recovery becomes critical, not just so much protecting the data. And then the threat management is a whole nother area. So I think what's going on right now in the security market that's exciting is, uh, or actually, <laughs> I shouldn't say exciting, but like important, uh, relevant in, in the sense of it's exciting, it's, it's top of mind, is the threats coming in are a real issue. Right. So I think that we're going to see an explosion of threat uh, countermeasures, an emphasis on technology to manage threats, Dave. Well, the threat and, management is just an underserved market and it's growing like a weed with the with the uh, money on the table, trillions of dollars of of, of uh, cybersecurity fraud and and threats. So Wendy Whitmore came on. She runs palo alto's unit 42 which is their threat intelligent unit intelligence unit so she has like they're kind of like you know kevin mandy at mandiant they have line of sight on all the the bad actors the nation states the the the, the organized crime and she said spear phishing is not really the most you know the biggest concern right now it's this mass vulnerabilities uh and so they're really changing the 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 attack strategies so that was kind of really eye-opening and then i thought you know i, I, I screwed up john shimoni's name it's shimoni <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, so when you go to sort of the anatomy of these these attacks you go back to stuxnet it was like they got through air gaps to get to the natanz uh, uranium enrichment facility amazing you know what they did there with programmable logic controller siemens plcs and then the sony hack that you just talked about uh, and it's just the the advances that are that are coming. And then George Kurtz talks about just the time it takes to exfiltrate data is like down to it's like seventy two hours now, and sometimes as low as seven hours. So speed becomes really, really important. Um, it's just a really fascinating topic. Yeah. And it is it is kind of exciting. It gets your heart pumping, to be honest. Well, with I mean, you. there's so much at stake. I mean, the money on the table. Everyone should go to the cube.net and check out the Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, episode three. It's part of our annual program we've been doing. So that was our, our, our showcase capstone summit for the year. And it had the entire community in there. Like you said, uh, Gil from Continuity was there. ZK Research was there. ZS was there. Um, of course, all, a lot of Dell content, uh, Palo Alto Networks. I thought Rob Stretche and Zias had a good point. Fight fire with fire. And I think that's a threat we're coming with. Forrester was on there. Uh, Mark Sorensen, an author. Kindrel, Atos, Davis Trump from Silicon Angle, our security um, head writer. And then, of course, the town of Gilbert, uh, Dr. Tony Bryson, Cube alumni, comes back again. He laid down a master class, Dave. So, yeah. you know, this was a really good event. You're going to see a lot more of this from the Cube. Obviously, we got our super studio, we call it. A lot more scale coming out of the cube, and and you'll see a lot more. And again, the CEOs in our audience love it. The developers love it, and the industry participants, and of course, the practitioners love it, Dave. One so. one more stat I want to share that came out of that uh, that came from Cybercrime Magazine. I like to give those guys credit because when I don't give them credit, I forget the guy's name. He always emails us and says, Can, "You know, hey, you got to give us credit. That's our data." And they actually do some good data. So the the cybersecurity, the spending on cyber software and services it's like i don't know let's call it a hundred billion but cybercrime magazine estimates that the economic impact just last year of cyber uh, uh threats cyber hacks were three trillion so we spend a hundred billion but the the economic impact is three trillion i mean that just shows you how big the gap is between you know what we're spending and the efforts that we're putting in and the ripple effects of the economic impact 
you know, it's just, it, it's not only when you, when you look at lost productivity, damaged reputation, hits to market cap, you know, et cetera, et cetera, add that up. It's just, it's yeah. just trillions of dollars, which is nearly the size. It's like three quarters of the size of the IT market. It's huge. Um, that's a lot of stuff going on. Check that out on, on the cube.net. Um, next up, Dave, Intel. Intel announced their ultra AI chip, uh, their core ultra. I call it the AI chip um, in New York City. I call it the not so splash in the pool because it it, it seemed like uh, a catch up or uh, uh, announcement you, on the heels of what AMD just did. I thought it was it 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 fell flatter than than I would expect Intel. Uh, but here's the news: they unveiled the uh, core ultra for notebook PCs and the fifth generation Xeon CPU servers. AI everywhere was the event. It's basically an, an AI chip. But they, the highlights are that they introduced the idea of a neural processing unit, which is not new in the system on chip design, making it a significant piece of Intel's architecture. Uh, AMD got that first. Um, T, the, the TPU with Google. The well, idea ARM. ARM with, with the NPU. Apple started shipping NPUs, what, I don't know, four or five years ago. It, integrating the NPU is critical. It gives them, the, and we talked about this on our last pod, actually, when we did, we unpacked AMD's announcement. It's the combination, the combination of CPU, GPU, and NPU is really the holy trinity of the three-way, um, three-way benefits, the flywheel for the new model of AI. And the internetworking, which you've brought up many times. Internetworking, it's what's around the chips. It's going to create a lot of value. So this is an architectural leap. And so it, the, what I like about the Intel announcement, it's directionally correct, but it felt a little bit me too, even though they threw a lot of fanfare around it. Um, and again, fifth generation Xeon, that's legit. But again, the market's competitive, Dave. AMD and Qualcomm are out there. They even used uh, NPUs and, and with Ryzen. Qualcomm expected Snapdragon X series with, with superior a, AI compute capabilities. Um We'll see what that comes in. But the industry implications, Dave, is that this now puts, in my opinion, the AI at the center of the conversation around chips. Okay, we've, we've been saying it for a while, but, you know, the new step function in architecture is here. Real-world applications, NPUs are going to be a significant contributor, okay, as more AI workloads become cloud-based, right? This is going to be the issue, right? Intel and AMD... Um, are focusing on this, as is AWS. And then the question is, with Intel, and this is what I don't know because they're kind of keeping it close to the vest, Can do they have software developer support, right? We yeah. said this with AMD. You know, if you well, look at NVIDIA's uh, CUDA, the software abstractions of the holy grail in these, these new environments, does Intel have the chops for the software developers? And can they bring that AI-accelerated application market to the table? And that's, well, that's going to be a big issue. They've obviously got a track record in software and ecosystem. It's just the the big difference this time is they're they're you know way behind the leader, which is Nvidia. I thought you know look the announcement you know they talked about Gaudi and it's you know the Habana acquisition, so we're finally seeing some results there. I don't think I mean let's see. So a couple of comments. One is when AMD made its announcement, you know that is that it was going to be shipping its GPUs. The stock popped the next day. It went up like fifteen percent. Intel was only up like a point yesterday, a little over a point, uh, but it was up. I, I don't think they didn't set like high expectations for this announcement. So it was kind of a meh announcement, but it's a fairness to Intel. They, it's not like they were saying it was going to be more than that. It was really, you know, kind of PC uh, uh, AI. So that's cool. I, I just see, honestly, I see Intel is kind of number three in this race. I think it's you know, NVIDIA is going to have the big market share. I think AMD's got, you know, AMD's market cap is now well over 200 billion, yeah. maybe 222, and Intel's under 200 billion. So AMD's yeah. a bigger company market cap wise than Intel. And so I think Intel's going to be number three in this race. Dave, I, who would have thought? Okay, go back a decade. Oh, my AMD, God. AMD uh, would be bigger than Intel. I would have taken that bet. I a mean, lot of people in Silicon Valley, you know, talking to me about this and they're, they're, they're concerned. Uh, they're worried about Intel, but here's how I squint through the the noise and all the analysts waving their hands. This is the best thing I've ever seen Intel do. It's not really. Is that what the analysts were saying? Because there's a payroll. lot of anal there, there's a lot of analysts out there saying that. But here's how I see the strategic impact. Number one, the AI PC is a new category, right? If you look at, it's not just about the new chip. I think if you look at it and say, hey, if AI is going to be on the notebooks. 
think about the gamer market. Dave. Think about all the applications that's going to have at the edge. We talk about compute and inference at the edge. This could be um, a wide open new category for Intel and and, and AMD and Qualcomm, by the way. They're not, not going to look at as well as Apple. And think of NVIDIA, my kids who want who have, who are gamers. They all have NVIDIA. In fact, they go into my PC and steal my NVIDIA card and swap out the, the cheaper one because I'm running basically Windows, right? So they, they, they steal my GPU while I'm not looking. They want the best gaming card. That's going to come to everything. So that's what I like about the announcement. Number two, the landscape on computing, if you look at some of the large language models that we've been covering on open source, they're running them on PCs. And we said this with Michael Dell, and we we met with the executives at Dell during their, um, you know, the private analyst briefings. We said to them that workbench, that local host developer market is going to be in the PC, not a server. It was AI everywhere, right? I mean, but 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 okay. So here's my question. And, and then and then third and then third third implication is so PCs become the new AI thing, like Nvidia with gaming, to the future landscape of AI chips. And then third, the GPU market is going to be highly contested. Okay, so NVIDIA, Intel's got to get in that game and that acceleration, the AI acceleration market is going to be hot. So three areas that Intel has to win with this. We'll be watching all three. If they fail on any other of these three, I don't see them moving the needle. But I mean, so here's my question is, how new is this? I mean, how much of this is, you know, from chat GPT versus, I mean, three years ago, my kid was like, I said, what do you want for Christmas? So I want to, you know, I want to, a PC with an NVIDIA card, <laughs> NVIDIA exactly. GPU in it. Right? I mean, <laughs> they've been getting this for a while. And so, and Apple has had, you know, the, 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 the M chip for years. Right. And this, so there's, well, there's remember- intelligence there. And, and we've had AI on our iPhone doing facial recognition for a long time. So yeah. how well, much of this is like, a, a, like how much of this is hype is I guess my question versus, and I agree with you. It's going to be AI everywhere, and the AI is just increasingly more capable, for sure, now that there's so much investment going in. But but how much of this is really you know, new versus normal progression? That's what I'm trying well, to figure well, out. Well, your, your point about your kids in the game, I think that's the opportunity Intel has to go after. So they don't want it to be NVIDIA. So remember back in the old days when Intel was the dominant one? You wanted the PC with the Pentium and the, last, the multiple cores. You, know, right. you, you, want, you actually sought that out. That's the way NVIDIA won that game. So I think Intel has to win on faster, smaller, cheaper, and performant. And and the kids and people are going to start tracking this. If it doesn't work, and again, unless we pointed out at reInvent and this whole past few years on the Cube, price performance hardware matters now. People are going to be tracking the speeds and feeds. So the AI leadership on the notebook has to be um, that. And, and it's akin to N- NVIDIA and gaming as an analogy. For all purpose, AI stuff will be. At, I, if if AI is in every app, you got to have notebooks that perform and phones. I, t- I tell you, John. I mean, you and I know, know Pat. We interviewed him maybe I don't know thirty times. Have great respect for him. If he pulls this off, and I and I say that because obviously there's a team effort, but he is the one to let it. He's he's trying to pull off a Satya Nadella like leadership transformation. I mean, if he can pull this off, not only is it is it like CEO of the century, but it's also great for the country. I just, as you know, I'm really skeptical that they're going to be able to to do this at an economic, you know, price. I, I got Ben. How do you say Ben's last name? By by, by Baharin, um, Bajarin, Baharin. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about the guy who yeah. runs stri- stri- uh, uh, Creative Strategies. Mm-hmm. I was talking to him at Reinvent, and he's going to come on a breaking analysis. He was supposed to come on today, but I had my friend's my, my, uh, 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 service. But um, he's really positive on Foundry. Intel Foundry. Now, if he's right, and he's probably he knows much more about this than I do, and I'm gonna have that's why I want to have him on to pick his brain about this because he's got models and he's into the supply chain. If he's right, that is a huge win for the country. I just I I'm, I remain a skeptic until I can really see that kind of progress. But boy, it seems like Pat's doing all the right things. I just well, my you know, first very interview- hard to catch up in semis. My first interview with Pat Gelsinger was when I started PodTech, my podcasting company, 20 years ago. Um, and he was in charge of the enterprise group. And when Ottolini um, became the CEO, Paul Ottolini, that was a moment where I think Pat should have been CEO. I think- No doubt. Ha- had Pat Gelsinger become CEO in 2005, I think it was, uh, with Ottolini who got it, 
it might have been a different uh, um, different company. And I think he's changed, and, and it's changed a lot since then. Because remember, he went to Dell. Remember, he left um, Intel to go to work for EMC. Yeah, Tucci, Tucci hired him to replace Donatelli. So, I mean, what a, that... what a power move that is. <laughs> Donatelli was like a you know legend, and certainly on the East Coast and inside of EMC. He leaves to go to HP, and then Tucci hires Gelsinger to replace him. That was like major recruiting who by Tucci. so craig craig barrett was like one of the key you know gordon moore andy grove kind of uh heir parents but olini was you know moved up the ranks there as well but the point the point is is that you mentioned about if he pulls this off the question on gelsinger if he got there sooner when odalini was ceo he might not have gone to emc he might not have gone to vmware we might not know what could have been and i think that's the key now the question i've always said is is it too late a lot of people at intel in Palo Alto, where I live and around Silicon Valley, have come to me and said, they're all cheering for Pat because he brings back that old Andy Andy Grove you know, mindset, Gordon Moore, the legacy, Robert Noyce. However, it might be too late. They're all, the whisper is, it's too late. Now that's, and that's what, to your point, it's not too late. He made some good news with the government, we got the whole geopolitical thing going on. He could pull this off. Okay, the question is, that's going to be the open question. Can he get in the AI game? Can they get back into the cloud game and not lose that business to custom silicon? Can they leapfrog ARM and compete with AMD and Qualcomm? And there's some serious competition, Dave. Okay. And it's going to be interesting to watch. I'm very influenced by my the work that I did with David Floyer on this, who's, you know, Floyer goes back to the IBM, you know, days when IBM was the leader. IBM was the number one leader in the world of semiconductors. And that's where Floyer cut his teeth. And he always impressed upon me, Dave, leadership in semiconductors comes from volume. If you don't have volume, you can't get, you know, yields to where you want them and you can't get your costs down to be as competitive as possible. And the reason that's so important is because because of things like Moore's law and whatever you want to call this new combinatorial law of GPU, CPU, NPU, et cetera, accelerators, because when you switch, you know, to a new technology, the costs go up. So you have to have that more you have to have what rights law in your in your in your favor which basically says your cost drop by a constant every time you double your cumulative volume and so in semiconductors that's probably let's call it you know 15 percent when you combine it with 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 moore's law or combinatorial law it gets down to maybe 30 plus percent your cost and so you need that cost advantage so here's my my point ARM wafer volumes are much, much higher than x86 wafer volumes. Uh, N- NVIDIA volumes in GPU are much higher than anybody else's. So they have the, the cost advantage. And Intel, when PCs peaked in 2011, you know, they lost their cost their cost advantage and they lost their volume advantage. And it's very, to your point about the Silicon Valley scuttlebutt, it's very difficult to, yeah. to regain that, especially when you're fighting, you know, a, a multi-front war in Foundry, in, in yeah. a, against AMD, against ARM, against NVIDIA, against China. It's like, the, we, that's why I say, if he pulls this off, it's like CEO of the, the millennium. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, I, Intel's act has, has been acting weird at a corporate level. Let's see. It seems like they're they're hiding something. I'm not sure what the, where the meat and the bone is. We'll have to dig into it. Anyway, let's move on to AI because that's the topic of why Intel even announced that direction. Um, and and are they going to be able to compete? We'll, we'll track that for sure. Our research team with Cube Research will. And of course, I'm writing a research note right now on this topic. Um, I'll publish that uh, shortly. AI. So Dave, okay, not a rant section, but quasi rant. The EU is regulating AI, and all my European friends are like, "Oh my God, can they screw up another?" Oh, thing? thank, thank God, the EU is going to save us from AI. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, out of the EU is a French startup called Mistral, which is made you know, mega funding. Okay, another big funding round, ironically, out of the EU, uh, um, and then more guardrails coming out you're seeing um event uh, more people talk about guardrails at these conferences um and then obviously the open ai research paper came out so let's talk about ai in the industry a lot going on there let's start with the the regulation um and the funding from Mistral, 450 million in funding and nvidia by the way backed nvidia amd backed 56 million dollar round for essential ai labs uh led by transformer architecture co-inventors so again more funding more regulations. Is it a collision course, Dave? 
You mean between the regulators well, between and the technology industry? In, yes, in, it is. In, innovation needs to run. Why are they going to stunt at birth, the growth at birth? Yeah, I mean, you, crazy. you've made this point since we we started this cube pod is that this is a bad thing if we if we have government trying to regulate when they can't keep up um the industry's moving so fast you know now the the big question is okay well then what's the answer you know could the industry can the industry self regulate and i don't really know the answer to that i do know the governments are not going to be in a good position to regulate they're going to have so many contradictions in their laws and in their policies I just don't see how they yeah. can keep up. I think it's well, going to stifle innovation if 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 these get tracked. And by the way, it probably will fail anyway because there's so much stuff going on that they won't even be able to catch. That uh, I just I don't see it's it. Gonna, it's gonna, see it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna kill entrepreneurship. It's gonna kill innovation, in my opinion. Here's why: innovation in AI is like like on, on nothing we've seen before in historic shifts. We are at a time now that only happens once a generation. Okay. The last time was the web before that PC. You can argue mobile, but I think that's web plus. But still, big inflection point, not generational. I was quite, I'd say generational, but you will put mobile in there. In these early markets, people have to feel and see the use cases and the user experience change. And if you regulate stuff too early with AI, the companies and the entrepreneurs won't be able to showcase their stuff for, so people can see and see the value, then understand it better. Okay. It's like shutting down the web. Oh my God, people are going to surf the web and, and, and uh, view porn or self-serve content without that, some middleman. That's bad. You know, it's like, uh, no, that's good. It's a feature, not a bug. So, so in like AI, you want to let it run. Like we said, in, to quote Andy Grove in, from Intel, let chaos reign and then reign in the chaos. I think that the, it'll hurt adoption in areas where there's innovation opportunities and cause people not to take a step forward. I think you can take a step forward without getting into trouble with AI and then monitor it. And then the more people step into it, the more eyes are on it, the more transparency there is, Dave, the more openness there is. And I think open source and choice are the key to success, just like the open web was. And I think open AI... Open AI being the concept of open, not open AI, the company, because I think they're closed personally. But openness and choice are key. That's why regulation fails. Yeah. So I agree. I, I don't think I, I think the, the the government has done generally governments that do a poor job on on regulating you know innovation. I think they've done a very poor job on regulating tech and in, in it with the antitrust, the history of antitrust, as we've talked about and I've written about pretty extensively is I think pretty abysmal um, when you look at, I mean, the example I always use is Bell Labs is now owned by Nokia. You know, <laughs> what more do you need? Have you, have you read Chip War? Have you read that yet? Yeah. I mean, that, you know, Bell Labs was this, you know, key part of that whole, you know, that Fairchild Semiconductor. And it's not even a U.S. company anymore. Anyway, the history of regulation and antitrust has not been great. Now, this open AI paper is kind yeah. of interesting. It came out yesterday. It's called weak to strong generalization, strong capabilities with weak supervision. And you know the idea here is normally the way you're training ML models is, is with human reinforcement. It's called RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Right, that's what you do. You get you get a human level of intelligence to train a less capable than human model, and you try to you know close the gap to human. Right. The idea is here's the basic premise of this open AI white paper, and they do tons of research. It's a very thoughtful paper. But the idea is when you have superhuman intelligence that's above the human, can you supervise it with AI, with less intelligent AI? The reason being, superhuman intelligence is going to be writing code, for example, you know, millions of lines of code that humans won't be able to understand at least certainly not in quasi real time. And so you need AI to basically supervise it. So they they tested how much they could close the gap. Now the problem is there's no such thing as superhuman intelligence yet. So what they had to do is say, can we train like a or supervise a GPT-4 with a GPT-2 and get it up to GPT-3.5 levels? Why is that important? Well, because they're, what they're testing is 
or will like John, you know how when you and I golf together, I yeah. drag you down to my level because I'm so bad <laughs> right there. So do the, does the more intelligent model learn from the dumber model or can the less intelligent model with multi shot prompting and other techniques raise up that the total outcome. And so it was a really fascinating paper. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of hype around AI, as you know. I'm waiting for the magic eight ball to be declared AI. Uh, but but so you, one wonders if, you know, this is like, you remember Good Will Hunting? Mm -hmm. um, where, uh, where, where, where the student was like, this shit's so fucking easy for me. You know, he throws it in his face, yeah. right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. like the student is like so much more intelligent than the professor. Is it like that? Yeah. And then the other thing I, I wonder, I was talking to a friend of mine who's deep into AI and the government. And he's like, I think we're in it. We're reaching a Zeno's paradox. Do you know what that is? <laughs> no. it, it's remember in high school, your math teacher blew your mind with this when he or she said, okay, the, the wall, you, the wall is 20 feet away. If you go halfway each time and cut in half the distance, you'll never reach the wall. And you're like, what do you mean? Same point is you got to, in order to get from point A to point B, you got to get to the halfway point. And the, there's so many half infinite halfway points that you never actually get there. And I wonder if we're, you know, at that phase of artificial general intelligence. Uh, but it was a really thoughtful paper. I, I may tackle it in a breaking analysis. It's 50 pages. I, I read most of it on the plane yesterday. Um, and I may tackle it this weekend for Monday's breaking analysis. I think it's worth. I think it's worth doing. And just on a side note, uh, on that Microsoft's multi-billion-dollar alliance with OpenAI was reported in the uh, Financial Times today that um, OpenAI quietly clarifies that the tech giant Microsoft has no equity in the company, despite the thirteen billion dollar investment. But it's in line. But it's in line to make big profits. So, um, what? Wait, I thought they own forty nine percent of the company. No, that's what they're saying here. According to it's not. Now, this comes back down to, not to change the subject, but back to AI. This being, comes back down to open AI's governance. Remember, you pointed out on your breaking analysis, and we ranted on the podcast, um, they have that co uh, convoluted corporate structure. Okay? So um, I'll send you the yeah, link. Even on, their, even on their website, they show they show 49% ownership for the for the C-Corp. Well, who this is an article that came out uh, today, okay, three hours ago. Tim Bradshaw from uh, and multiple people in London and San Francisco. Uh, what George, publication? The Financial Times. Yeah, search how Microsoft multi-billion dollar alliance with OpenAI really works. Um, goes into great detail. After the UK officials said they were preparing to investigate OpenAI and Microsoft's relationship with them. Remember, we reported that last podcast. I don't know if you remember. But we kind of mentioned that that uh, they, they uh, that the uh, UK competition group. Remember, they went after Microsoft yeah. as well, right? And they had the whole Teams thing. So Microsoft's under siege uh, from the UK. Again, my friends in the UK are like they can't get enough of this nonsense. They're like they're like they, the government's crazy. People are pissed off in the UK and in the EU. By the way, the younger generation are like, why are you screwing up our future? So they're, they're just killing innovation. But this article comes in from that. Um, inquiry, the government inquiry. So, um, yeah, but this is so, consistent. This is consistent with what I wrote. Uh, Microsoft has ago. Microsoft's only a minority economic interest. There's no, equity. Yeah, no, no, no. but well, hold on, I, you know, hold on. Let's go into no, this. But, but this is word wordsmithing because you got here's what you have. They see that picture in this this article. You got the board of directors, which is a a, a nonprofit company. Board of directors all nonprofit, which is absurd. But let's forget that for a second. They, the board of directors controls the 501c3, which is a public charity. It's an open AI nonprofit. They wholly own the open AI LLC, which is a, the operating company, which controls the holding company for open AI nonprofit plus the employees plus investors. So the investors like Vinod Kosla and the employees own that holding company. And then that holding company is a 51% owner of the open AI global LLC, which is a capped for-profit company of which Microsoft is a 49% owner. So it's okay. true that they don't have any, they have a, they have okay. a minority ownership in that 
LLC, which is the capped profit company. So it's consistent with, I mean, this is, that's not anything new. It's just, they're playing games with words. This is a direct quote. However, neither Microsoft nor OpenAI's other backers, which include Thrive Capital and Sequoia Capital, own any conventional equity shareholding in the company. Yeah, that's instead, true. It's, instead, not it's a very instead, non-conventional. Instead, let me finish. Instead, they are entitled to receive a share of profits from a specific subsidiary of the OpenAI up to a certain limit. So what they're doing, again, back to your point. And, and, okay, and, the, and, the trans- hold on, hold on, hold on and, hold on. and excluding, hold on, and excluding the AGI IP. That's why they structured it this way. So they capped okay. the profits. They gave them basically shadow equity, I would call it. Okay. And they don't get any of the AGI IP. So yeah, it's non it's non conventional. Let, let, let me let me that, translate. Let me let me translate for the audience out there. Um, that's that's this capital structure and Byzantine system. They basically have a separate company set up for the profits. So they technically don't own any equity, but they're going to get dividends when they do the step ups and how they sell shares. Again, this back down to the why I think this is a setup for potential failure day because. Now you have a corporate governance problem, even though that Microsoft's got a board of observer seat. Um, it, the the intra, intricate details of the the pie, the chart, it's like a flow chart. It's like it's a co- it's like writing code. It's like if then this goes over here, you know, OpenAI, GP, LLC own wholly owns and controls the nonprofit. But where does the money flow? Where do you put the money in? So. Um, the OpenAI Global is an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. So again, that's usually a flow-through entity used to capture profits, not for shareholders. Again, different. Yeah, exactly. Structure. So I just I just put my post into the the chat with you and Brendan, and I added some. Um, I annotated that chart that the FT had, and with some speculation on what the what the open ai gp does which is some kind of operational role they probably have some r&d stuff uh so you know take a look at that i don't know if brendan hey, can look at, look add this, that in this this oh, first of all i wasn't really trying to litigate your post because your post was great my point is it's a nuance to your post no it's your consistent post was, it's yeah, consistent it's with consistent. my you, post yeah, yeah you had it right just but the point is is that the regulators are circling that's why I brought it up. The regulators are circling, and then they got to disclose some more distractions from Microsoft, more distractions for OpenAI. They should be spending all their time blowing up this capital structure, blowing up this corporate structure, this Byzantine lines, and just reset the whole thing because there's so much money to be made. The interests are going to f- end up fighting over who's got what carcass. This is what happens you know, you when know, a it's... nonprofit controls a for-profit. It's like Harvard University. Right. Let's face yeah, it. Yeah. That's a that's a hedge fund. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'd rather I mean, see people die in Israel than give up their hedge well, fund status. I, 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 right. I mean, yeah. so it's it's a it's a nonprofit. It's like you know the, the certain certain you know religious organizations, churches, right? That they, they're really for profit companies hiding in a nonprofit. By the it's, way, it, speaking of the Harvard, did you our rant last week? My rant. I think our rant. I think when, I know I ranted on. I think you did too. The Harvard, the whole testimony in Congress. Boy, did that go supernova this week, Dave. Um, the, the the CEO of Wharton's gone. They actually voted to keep the Harvard CEO in there because she would not relent. And again, remember the my quote: "This is the woke culture kind of backlash." Every, that everyone's saying the same thing. Could someone please like like can we put this chapter to bed? Like it's terrible. They're just a hypocrisy of justifying the death of, of Israelis. It's just incredible. Well, the president I mean, of UPenn, like, president of UPenn, and by the way, I, I it's like I, 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 my heart goes out to all innocent victims here, Israelis, Palestinians. I mean, the whole war just just sucks. But so the but the 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 president of of UPenn basically had it was given every opportunity. To say, to, as, was, you know, as, was, that. as was the Harvard. I and didn't the, see, I didn't see the Harvard. It was exactly the same footage. interrogation. It was the same thing. And then the board. It was embarrassing. The, the it was really embarrassing. The board, and then, and then voted. the president of UPenn walked it back the next day. And I'm she like, still got fired. Eh, she should have been fired. That yeah, was they, just poor judgment. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> so, and then, right. but, but now you, but you think about the open AI board, yeah. you know, I mean, what were they thinking? And then, you know, Ilya got caught up in that. And that's, by the way, in that paper, 
I, yeah. It's funny. The Twitter comments say, where's Ilya on that paper? And But he's on the paper. So I wonder if, an, if the first version of the paper didn't have him on there because of the sensitivity, all the rumors that were floating around about they made some breakthrough in AGI. I don't think this is a big AGI breakthrough, but they're one step closer, I guess. And we still might be, you know, 100 years away for all we know. Or we could be 10 years away or five years or two years. You know, it's very hard to predict. Um, I mean, look, when when in 2018, when sort of this whole thing really started to take off from an investment standpoint, I got to believe investors like Vinod Kosla had had no clue when this thing was going to have have its iPhone moment. I mean, I don't think there's anyone who could have predicted it was going to be November of 2022. And then, yeah. boom, it's like, you know, f- five years later, it's like it's so much hype now around AI. And and I think it's important, John. Yeah. to point out to people that there is a lot of hype. And while a lot of the hype is justified, you know, a lot of it is bullshit. So you just got to be really careful. Uh, I think, I, again, Silicon Angel's got a good story on this. Rob has an uh, article on there. Um, and so just check out, check out SiliconAngle.com. Got some great articles on this. Open AI and all the news is happening. And again, now, now getting back to kind of open AI, speaking of who's winning and losing, Oracle apparently had earnings and their GPU supply got impacted Dave, what's your analysis yeah on, i know i don't Oracle. know it was so much the gpu supply but may, that could have been well, part it, of it, it but it came it, up in, in the earnings call no, i know uh, yes but it was also i think just data center supply their ability to build data centers so oracle it was kind of a mixed quarter they paid 28 billion dollars for cerner and we knew cerner was going to be soft this quarter and it was but oci came in lower than expected uh i think 25 percent growth versus 27 percent growth and Oracle said it was because of supply issues. Part part of it certainly could have been GPU, but it was also data centers. They can't build data centers fast enough. And so you could see their CapEx was lower than people had expected. Um, but they say they have really good demand. So who knows? It was a buying opportunity for, for Oracle. We're not, the by the way, we're not huge. Yeah, stock was down like 6 7%. But I mean, we're not. You know, we're not financial advisors, so you got to do your own homework. Just, you know, but demand, I think, is pretty healthy. Their revenue growth was, you know, off, it was like five and a half or 5.4 versus 6.3% expectation. But they beat operating margin. Um, and so they were able to control their costs. And they did a big, big, huge share buyback, like almost a half a billion dollars in share buybacks, which, of course, you know, will prop that thing up. But I actually, so I've, I've been peeking at the ETR data, the the January data. It's really interesting, John. Microsoft, which is always like amazingly super strong. Not, I'm not saying Microsoft is going to you know feel the effects here, but it's a little bit softer. And I think that's some of that is the you know people turning t- shutting off co-pilots and the whole open AI meltdown. Amazon is definitely getting a lift from reInvent. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as is Google from its its announcement. But I'll tell you, Oracle, a- Oracle and and Dell actually are seeing some momentum in cloud, which is really interesting, but especially Oracle and IBM. So you're seeing these hybrid on-prem guys actually seeing a little bit of momentum in what the customers view as cloud. Remember, they think of cloud as an operating model, yeah. you know, not a place. And so yeah. that's yeah. how they answer these surveys. And so, but Oracle is showing, just by, based on the preliminary day, ETR data that I saw, is showing a meaningful like a really measurable uptick in spending momentum and in, in intended spending momentum. So I believe them when they say, based on the ETR data, I believe them when they say that demand is really strong. We're supply constrained with data centers. Yeah. And, and we're, and we're finding out from um, all the conversations we're having. Um, and I just did some interviews with some of the people at pure storage um, and they have a flash solution, which is actually great for sustainability. And what we're talking about them about is, is that in Europe, and other areas, but pretty much consistent across the world. The trend is there's not enough room to build data centers. The constraint of power and cooling is going to limit the net new data center. So the scarce resource of our future world is data center resource. Um, as we used to say, the motherboard was the constraint for a PC, which put how many chips you can put on there. Power and cooling will be the constraints for the AI world. In some cases, people can't afford to pay their power bill and and to run their company um so because they need expansion so power energy savings is a huge factor and it's not so much save the planet kind of vibe although that's kind of nice to have say hey you know save the planet rah rah 
It's called save the internet. It's like save AI, right? AI uses a ton of power. And that's, again, not talked about. Remember Pat Gelsinger when we interviewed him at VMware? Blockchain just sucks all that power. He's kind of right. And, 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 and by the way, they used a lot of GPUs too. So blockchain used a lot of power. And AI uses a lot of power. I think Rob Stretchy and our, our research team was quoting that every four queries uses like a, a gallon of water on open AI. So, or some stat, I, I'll get the actual stat, but you know, we'll get Rob on that, on that stat. But his point was every three queries on, on chat GPT is using up significant resource. So imagine that times millions. That's so, the issue what we're dealing with here, Dave. So, so Larry Ellison on the call said, I'm just looking at the transcript now. I haven't had a chance to dig in. He said basically that they're, they're, there's virtually unlimited demand for their data centers. He says OCI is going to grow above 50%. He said the demand quote is extraordinary. We can build the data centers relatively fast, and I expect the OCI growth rate to be over 50% for a few years. Yes, says Safra Katz, we are not demand limited in any way right now i mean wow that is i mean oracle's kicking ass there's no doubt about it i think i think they got flat-footed on the growth but they see the visibility and with as you always said they are a perfect private cloud company because it's engineered systems right so you know oracle has a play oracle's play of uh, you know having companies be their their hardware if you will um is going to be important now the question is can you know, this is going to be the, 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 the strategic question for Oracle. And this is the so-called elephant in the room, as they say. Will Can Oracle get over themselves and realize that there's multiple databases out there? That's going to be, to me, the big, the big thing. And if they do that, plus OCI, as my private cloud or, quote, hardware for AI, meaning it's stored somewhere, as Larry Elson said, <laughs> servers are stored in the cloud, there's servers still. So, you know, there's a play there. As you said, Dave, always said, they have an engineered system. And if you look at what Amazon did at reInvent with the GPUs and cobbling together the Grace Hoppers from NVIDIA with the interconnect, they're essentially building a system, engineering a system. So, I, uh, you know, what gives? I, I think Oracle feels like we've got the best database chops in the business. We're the database king. We don't need no other stinking database. I mean, I would love to see Oracle on OCI well, start how, offering alternative the question, databases. The question for you is, is that is that dogma legit or is that real or is it dogma that's going to hurt them? Well, so far, it hasn't hurt them. Uh, um, <laughs> how, many so far are, worked out. how many workloads are running on Oracle? I know Cohere oh. runs on Oracle. But is well, that, and then he, he well, then now it, so look at it's like we talked real, about last real, week. On, re, real workloads. Okay, but it's, it's like we talked about last week on. Well, what do you mean by real workloads? But talk, we talked last week about scale up is coming back. Oracle is the mission critical cloud. There is nobody in the planet that can run mission critical workloads better than Oracle. IBM could be the one challenger there, but Oracle smokes uh -huh. everybody on mission critical workloads. Trust me. We but this this we know. We have so many proof points and data points. Oracle is the king of mission critical. Now, they're not the king of business critical. That's on a SQL server, right? And a lot of other databases. Mission critical on Oracle database, not necessarily cloud. Mission critical on Oracle database, but because they've got <laughs> exadatas running in the OCI, <laughs> right? You don't you don't see exadatas running in yeah. in Amazon, right? You do see them running now in Azure. So yeah. Azure's, you know, but but Azure doesn't have, you know, you saw Zeus Caravalla's post on <laughs> Silicon Angle. He was kind of shitting on on Microsoft's security posture, rightly so. And so, you know. To have mission critical, you got to have great security. Oracle has great security. They have great recoverability. They have great performance. If you want, that's why they're so expensive. They can they can get it. They're running the banks of the world. They're running, you know, kind of like the IBM mainframe. But but anyway, let me. I, I wanted to share another little quick tidbit from the uh, earnings call. He said, "Let me give you one example because to your point about constrained on GPUs, we got enough NVIDIA GPUs for Elon Musk's company, XAI, to bring up their first version, the first available version of a large language model called Grok. They got that up and running, but boy, did they want a lot more. They want a lot more GPUs than we could give them. We gave them a lot, but they wanted more. And when we're in the process of getting them more. So no question, you know, GPUs were a big part of that constraint. I totally love that. Again, we'll see. Again, I was just kind of throwing the haymakers out there on, on Oracle, mainly to ask the provocative questions. They actually might be in a good position to sequence with OCI for some of the demand side things that they mentioned in their earnings, that they're 
that could, as the game shifts, look at it. As you always say, Dave, the horses on the track, I always say, you know, the, the cars on the track. When you have inflection points like this, the order, the pecking order can change very rapidly. The swing of a trend, who's got the tailwind, who does the better marketing, always a case. Again, we've been doing the cube for 13 years with Silicon Angle, we keep on now called the cube research. We've seen this movie. We've been through multiple inflection points. Okay. It's always the case. High quality, have the right tailwind, take advantage of that tailwind. That's the key to success, whether it's Oracle or a big company. And the winners that I see lining up right now are the ones that see the demand side quickly and get their company in line, get that boat pointed in the direction of the tailwind, just throw the sails up. And I think that's what I heard on that earnings call was we might have made some mistakes or maybe some supply constraints, but we're going hard at the demand side to fulfill it. There's a market. It's real. The hype is good. The sizzle's there. The stake will come. And that's that's how you figure out the pretenders from the winners, right? The, whoever has the sizzle and the stake win. I see people out there all the time right now talking about acquisitions, sizzle this, all oh, sizzle, but they have no they have capabilities. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've if, always, you know, if you go I, private I, equity, you start doing acquisitions, you're in a roll up, you're not innovating, right? It's like I see, and that came up in, in storage. You know, you see the word private equity. I mean, Fitzgerald, Fitzy, or Charles Fitzgerald, Fitzy, he loves to rant on the private equity signaling. Oh, private equity is involved, company's dead. In yeah. this market, in this market, if you're in private equity, okay, you're not succeeding because you have well, no I, R&D budget. And you have no innovation strategy. I, I, I've always had a lot of respect for Oracle's ability to turn R and D into product, and that's something that IBM, I think, for years was challenged doing. I actually am really encouraged with the sort of new IBM management under Arvind Krishna's direction and Dario Gill coming out of the sort of research facility of their in, in, intense focus on turning R and D into product. You know, like you know, getting their mojo back. Oracle, I think, has always done that. Um, you know, they're not, you know, in my mind, they're not, you know, number one innovator in the world, but they take innovation and they apply it and look what they've done with, look what they've done with my sequel. When they acquired sun, they got my sequel, they got Java, they got all these kind of cool tools and platforms and they just let my sequel sit there for a long, long time. Um, and then, you know, you, you had, you, you had Maria DB come out. Um, uh, um, and, and so, but when when you see what they did with MySQL Heatwave, it's actually pretty remarkable. I mean, you see what Amazon's doing with no ETL, uh, integrating transactions and analytics. Well, that's what Oracle did with MySQL Heatwave. Now they had no market share, and so they really had nothing to lose. But they are mm -hmm. really innovating at a very very rapid pace with with MySQL Heatwave, and they've got the Oracle, you know, the God database, you know, the Oracle database. I mean. I, I, I look at, I mean, the stocks at a nearly an all time high. I mean, you can't, I mean, despite the recent pullback, you gotta, right, let, and you, you gotta have respect for that. Let's, in my let's, view. let's move on um, quick, quickly more layoffs in media wired had layoffs. Uh, Fox media's lay other, other areas are, are, are impacted by the whole shift. LinkedIn uh, is not moving to Azure uh, and HashiCorp's co-founder Mitchell Hashimoto is leaving the company. To dabble in new areas and, and tend to his family's first child. He's been on the queue 2015, his first time on. HashiCorp, Terraform, big success, went public. Um, uh, great company. Um, a a generational company, Dave. Um, high quality people, great management team. Uh, the only problem that I have with HashiCorp, they haven't done any business with the queue. <laughs> we haven't covered any of their events. They've all been virtual. Um, but uh, we've had many conversations with um, the founders on the cube. Um, and they just really did a good thing. And I think him stepping away is a bad signal for the company. Usually when founders stay around, there's a signal signal there. So, you know, my question is going to be, um, what's going on with Mitchell? Was there a falling out? Did he feel like he was irrelevant? Um, are the founders just kind of on the shelf? What's happening? Um, are they under comp competitive pressure? Uh, we know about the whole open source change of their license was that involved i mean just questions come up and uh, his goodbye uh, note wasn't didn't really address those so again we're in a really weird market companies are falling out of the sky startups are failing even some of the ai startups are impacted by by these big moves by the big whales the rag and the the um the, the companies that are doing a lot of the retrieval stuff 
Will they be relevant? Open source is gaining ground. So, Dave, you know, this is the, 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 the there, there's winners and losers. There, it's happening. So, layoffs show me that there's an old media guard there, old companies that are on the wrong side of this, going to have to lay people off. Like I said earlier, private equity is a signal of there's no there there. Let's get a buyer, liquidate, um, or shut down. And so that's an interesting signal. And the and the LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft, not going to Azure. I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean Azure's not adequate cloud, or is it Azure's kind of all in to support open AI? Where's where's LinkedIn run today? They have their own data centers and they have a very complex, they got Kafka for streaming. I mean, they got a well run operation. I mean, let's just let's just be let's just be clear. Link, LinkedIn is no, it's not shabby infrastructure. They have huge scale and it's just, it is what it is. They just have their own data center. Yeah, my, pre- they, and they announced their migration in 2019 in, in great fanfare. Um, um, and it was suspended. To, so, uh, they announced it, uh, a, a migration to Azure. In 2019, LinkedIn's migration to Azure was announced. Okay. And they just in, suspended it indefinitely. Um, so, you know, they got really kind of good stuff over there. But generally speaking, I mean, LinkedIn's pretty sophisticated environment. Uh, you know, started out pretty simple. It was just like an online Rolodex, and now it's like this huge network. I think generally speaking, when you do a migration, and I've had a lot of experience with you know consulting with companies that are trying to do migrations. When you do a big migration, you almost always have to freeze the code. And when you free, because you can't, you know, keep making changes, you'll, you'll never catch up. You'll have two parallel paths and they'll never converge. Um, and so the question then becomes, okay, if, when we freeze the code, what's the business impact? You know, there's things are happening so fast in the business. If I freeze the code, I'm going to fall behind, I'm not going to be able to, to, yeah. you got to fix bugs and you, you got to make trade-offs. And so a lot of times the business case for migrating, really, that's why CIOs hate migrations. The business case, a lot of times, is not there. So the question becomes: Okay, what's the impetus to migrate? Is it is it are we going to replatform and there's going to be kind of a whole new set of capabilities, or is it just kind of a lift and shift? And you know, a lot of times, that lift and shift is not going to get you the kind of business impact that you want. It might save you a few bucks, but it could cost your business on the other end. I mean, I've seen I've seen businesses risk risk their survivability trying to you know get off of a mainframe for instance because they had old cobalt code and they yeah. they were going to save two million dollars a year and it cost them two billion dollars in market cap you know? <laughs> <laughs> well I just forwarded an article to you on on the uh, on your chat about in, uh, Intel just so we close that out Gelsinger was was quoted as saying that CUDA is shallow. And motor <laughs> Unlike he, our AI software. Okay. The, <laughs> oh okay. boy. His quote was the entire industry is motivated to eliminate the CUDA market. He calls it sh- the moat shallow and uh, non sustainable. He's shallow saying it's is, a shallow moat. He, sa- he really? says, we, no, he says, we think of the CUDA moat as shallow and small. Gelsinger went on because the industry is motivated to bring a broader set of technologies for broader training, innovation data science, et cetera. So it reminds me, John, they can't do that to our pledges. Only we can do that to our <laughs> pledges. We, that's, that's our monopoly. <laughs> it's so cool. Your uh, animal house reference for the younger crowd there. Uh, it's a good one. <laughs> well, uh, food fight is definitely happening here in the chip industry, Dave, on, on that note. Um, great, great podcast. Uh, do we have time for a quick rant? My rant is uh, um, simply going to be more of the, the fact that the chip wars are here. And, you know, my rant this week is about industry um, news, media, commentary. I think my rant is that the, you're seeing a lot more vanilla content coming out, less analysis, less journalism. Good journalism are being rendered down to a few good sites like siliconangle.com, our site, the information um, in the trade. Uh, Tech Target has still has some good reporting, Beth over there and others. Of course, the mainstream media is still going to be doing their mainstream thing, but you start to see the lack of, of of good outlets, and the ones that are faking it, the ones that are uh, getting private equity, they're struggling, and you're starting to see the the shift. 
And I think the user behavior of the AI is going to move to future value of, of content, meaning quality, flight to quality. So I think we've seen this movie before with the dot-com bubble, the flight to quality. When mobile happened, it took two years. Apps started getting better. You know, you threw sheep for the first few apps. You know, you played games and the apps got better. I think in AI, we're going to see a, a one or two year kind of like el very elementary things and then flight to quality. And we saw that, and it's going to happen accelerated basis. I remember the mobile days when the App Store came out with iPhone. Um, it took about a year. The first couple of apps were throwing sheep on Facebook, you know, downloading simple games. And then it got better. Airbnb, Dropbox, real applications came on that were SaaS-based. Obviously, Amazon Cloud had a big part of that, and that became that wave. I think we're going to have a similar impact to what's happening now. So my rant is... Be careful of all the misinformation, all the bad data, the fake it till you make it content, fake it till you make it apps, uh, security phishing, all that good stuff and, and random. So be careful out there. That's my rant. Uh, and uh, the regulation, I could go there, but that's just a continuing, turn it into a continuing rant. Oh. But my rant is sort of a far cry from the middle. And I don't, I don't, I very rarely, if ever, talk about politics, you know, on the cube or in these kind of cube pods. A little, little bit we get into politics, and that's not really our thing. But I, you know, Sh Sean Hannity, Fox News is unwatchable, in my opinion. He's just, he's there to d divide. And I think, but frankly, Rachel Maddow on the other side is just as bad. But uh, somebody sent me a link of Joe Manchin on Hannity this week. And, you know, whether you like Joe Manchin or not, I, I got to do more research on him. He's he's much more down the middle. And I think so many so much of today's narrative is meant to divide as opposed to educate. And I think that I would really like to see a candidate, whether it's Manchin or others, candidates for president that are there to bring the country together, as so many have promised to do and have not. So I, I'm sort of really sick of all this divisiveness. I'd like to see some compromise. I'd like to see some, some positivity between business and government. Uh, the government right now seems to be just out to get business. The U S U S could have owned arm, you know, that they allowed it, that NVIDIA acquisition to go through. Now, maybe, maybe there were some antitrust concerns, but there were probably some things that could have been done uh, with the industry to, 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 to be able to get the U S to get that asset seems like every time I turn around, the current administration is trying to to knock down business. And I just, I don't like it. I, and I'd like to see a much more moderate uh, discourse in, in government, a much tighter private and public partnership, because I think now is the time to bring our, our country together and compete on a global yeah. basis. Amen. You know? I agree. We got to get the politics out. I, and by the way, on a side note on that, I saw Andreessen Horowitz, a big VC firm, is are going to weigh in on political candidates for the first time as a VC fund. I mean, they're going to endorse political candidates that align with their tech vision of the future. So you got accelerationists, you got decelerate decels, decel decels, you got altruism, all kinds of weird stuff happening, Dave, with AI. And again, AI is causing a lot of conversations to happen. Again, let chaos reign and reign in the chaos. That's the cube pod this week, <laughs> episode 40. Have a great weekend, Dave. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody.